Continuing with our series, oh, that we might be a people filled with the daring power of biblical hope. The daring power of biblical hope I wanted included in that title because I think the reason God fills our hearts with the kind of hope we've been looking at, introduced last week, is not just so that we can be happy but so that when it comes to his kingdom, we can actually be reckless. You can be more confident up on the high wire when you know there's the net underneath and that we have a hope that can't be taken from us and that we have one who promises to care for all of our needs and that we aren't ultimately satisfied or fulfilled by any earthly security. And if that's the case, the intent behind all of that instruction and exhortation to hope is so that we can confidently risk and endeavor great things for God because you can't lose. And so that we might be filled with the daring power of biblical hope. Today we're going to look at the sources of hope, this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning. Three sources of hope, the grace of God, the body of Christ, and the encouragement of the Scriptures. A number of texts that I'm going to read. We'll probably just look at one of those this morning and two of them next Sunday morning. If you have your Bibles, look these passages up with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 through 17. After that, we'll look at Hebrews 10, 
Then we'll look at 1 Peter 3. Second Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The third text is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and then 22 to 25. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Down to 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And then one more, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17, the hope that comes from grace. Hebrews chapter 10, 23 to 25, the hope that comes from holding fast our confession as we meet together. 1 Peter 1, 3, Romans 15, 4, the hope that comes from the scriptures. The three sources of hope. Last week we, we took some time to study the nature of hope in, in general and biblical hope in particular. And I gave several illustrations at the beginning of that teaching on the nature of just the way we use hope even in common speech and the way we refer to it. And we usually use the word hope to describe an earnest desire. I hope, I hope dad gets home early from work so we can go out and shoot some baskets. It's our hope that our son Jim will arrive safely from Africa. And I gave a number of illustrations like that. And the hope expresses an earnest desire crossing of the fingers. And I said that biblical hope is different in that it could be defined as a certain confident expectation based on the faithfulness of Father God. 
So it's, it's not a desire. It's not just a wish. But it's a confidence. It's a certainty that is grounded on the promise, the grace of Father God, especially revealed in Christ. And so we saw right off the bat that we need to be uh, definitive on what we're saying about hope. Hope is different from a good outlook on life. Hope is different from a person who, you just say, so-and-so is just naturally optimistic. They're always cheerful. And that's nice. That's a good thing. That's nothing to do with biblical hope. Hope is not a good self-image. A healthy self-esteem. That's not hope. Hope is not the same as possibility thinking. Biblical hope, New Testament hope in particular, is a certain confident expectation of what God will do based on the faithfulness of his promise and grace. Then we moved on through that teaching just to look at how important hope is. We wrapped up the teaching looking at how faith fuels how hope fuels both faith and holiness. And in fact, we looked at one text from 1 Peter 3.15 that says that it's my hope that people should notice. You've probably taken courses in in, uh, evangelism, perhaps Christian witness. Maybe you've studied apologetics. And you've kind of sorted out in your own mind, how you would explain to someone why you believe what you believe and why you believe it's true. And so maybe you're in a a high school setting or a college setting or a university setting, and so what you will read will be slightly different depending on what level you're attacking that subject from. But what you do is you kind of arm yourself so that when people come and they say, why do you believe in God? You'll have some grounding under your feet and you can say well here's why i believe god exists and you've got all sorts of arguments that you can marshal on that subject or you might say here's why i believe jesus christ was divine here's why i believe jesus rose from the dead Um, here's why i believe in bible prophecy and the fulfillment of bible prophecy here's why i believe The Bible is the Word of God and unique in its authority. And we went through a whole series, Why I'm a Christian, and looked at all of those subjects. They're important enough, and it's good to know those things. None of them addresses the real question. What what is it that will make people come up and want to talk to you about those things? In other words, it's wonderful that you have all those arguments and you have all those tools for conversation and things that make your faith credible, and sustainable in your mind, that's good. But the guy who's mowing his grass across the fence, what's going to make him want to talk to you about those things? And that's the subject that Peter addresses in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, but in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy. That's really important. It is so easy especially in this world, and especially if you've grown up in the church and and in a Christian home, it's very easy to think that you can somehow have a belief about who Jesus is and isn't that nice, but not really regard him as holy and that he cares about you being holy and that he judges people who are unholy. So you, 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 you regard Christ the Lord as holy And he says, always being prepared to make a defense. Okay, there it is. I've I've got my reasons. I've got my arguments. Good. That's good. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Have you noticed that link before? Have you ever heard someone come and they share how They led this person to the Lord or that person to the Lord. And you think, well, that's great. Uh, Peter, I like what you're saying there. And and if people were just sort of waltzing up to me all the time saying, what is it you believe about Jesus Christ? I'd be ready to tell them. Honest, I would. Nobody's asking me. I don't want to go down the street and just 
cold knock on all the doors and start telling them about Jesus. Well, what makes people want to know? The people you work with, the people you teach with, the people in your office, the people in your business. What makes them want to know these things? Well, what makes them want to know these things, they look at you and they say, you know, he's, he's, he's marked by some kind of assurance and hope. And of course, when they notice it most, and here's the tough part, when they notice it most is when they look at your life and they look at my life and they think to themselves, you know, the things that give me confidence and steadfastness and assurance, they've all been stripped away. And he still has hope. And I can't figure that out. In other words, it's, business isn't going well. You know, how many relate to that topic in this kind of an economy? We're not blessed with great health. Don't know what the future holds. Problems that do not go away. And it's not that you just sort of are running around confessing that everything's fine. That doesn't change anything. It's that they see that underneath all of that, when all these things, these props are knocked away, you still have a steadfast hope. And they, and they want to know, where does that come from? Do you understand what I'm saying? Where does that hope come from? That's the subject we're looking at. Where does hope come from? My hope in Christ exceeds any source of hope that anyone else has outside of Christ. So if people notice anything about me as a Christian, later they'll notice my beliefs. Later they'll hear my, hear my arguments. But if anything is noticed about me immediately, it should be my hope. They should find it so amazing that they can't keep themselves from approaching me and asking me about it. They, they will be overwhelmed by, secure, by curiosity that will make them push past their normal shyness. And they'll want to know, where does that hope come from? So strong is the appeal of hope that they will see in our lives. It's an incredible verse of Scripture. Now, obviously, hope is vitally important in the Christian walk. And in future studies, we're going to spend a lot of time in detail looking at the fruit of hope, the things that result from keeping our hope strong and bright. Things like joy, perseverance, things like purity, things about like righteousness, things like confidence in prayer. Those are all the fruit of hope. Hope. What we're looking at this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning is not the fruit of hope, but rather the source of hope. Last week, what hope is, why it's so important, how it fuels faith and holiness. It's really important. Today, where does it come from? It's the natural question. Where does hope come from and how can I get more of it? The three sources of hope are the grace of God, the encouragement of believers in the local church, and the indwelling word of God. Those are the three sources of hope. Let's start with the first one. First, hope from the grace of God. And the text is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And to this he called you through our gospel. 
so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm. So, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. And then he's going to tell us how to do it. Stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. So they aren't just to be looking for new things all the time. There's, there's these traditions that have been handed on to them. And Paul says, now you hold on to those things. Hold on to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So there's the authority in, in those writings. That's what he wants them to do. Now he's going to start to tell them how this works. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, verse 16, and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Notice those words in verse 17, good hope through or by grace. There's your first source of hope. This is where hope comes from. It comes from God's grace. But that's not quite enough. More specifically, it comes from, he says, noticing and contemplating our experience of grace in Jesus Christ. In other words, there are implications of grace that I, I don't just... It's not just a package that comes down wrapped from heaven. It is free. But to flesh out my hope, to be effective in my life in terms of not only getting me to heaven, but filling my heart with hope. Paul says there's things about it that need to be worked through, that need to be remembered, that need to be pondered. So I'm, I must tell myself things like this. When I read these verses, if there's no grace, there is no hope. That means that if my salvation depends on anything other than grace, there's no hope. There are many systems and there are many religions designed to somehow reach God in this world. And all of them have good teachings in them. All of them have good moral instruction in them. All of them have high aspirations. Most of them have some kind of books, sacred books, writings, moral codes... But hear me, all those religions can do, all any religion can do is give instruction. And that's fine as far as it goes, but, but hope doesn't come from instruction. Hope comes from grace through Jesus Christ. Sometimes people get this all mixed up. You, you'll hear conversations about people in other religions and what about people who practice their religion sincerely and faithfully? Are they somehow saved and reached through the practice of their religion? To my mind, the answer is no. But the, the thing people miss is, not only are people in other religions not saved by practicing their religion faithfully, it's not just a failure to understand other religions. It doesn't even understand Christianity. Let me tell you something. You aren't saved by practicing your religion faithfully. And if you can't be saved by practicing Christianity faithfully, how can you be saved by practicing any other religion faithfully? See, the reason you're saved is not because you practice the Christian faith better than the person sitting behind you. And if that's the concept you have of how you practice the Christian life and how it works then you just don't understand what Paul is saying here. And I'll tell you what, you, you don't have hope. Because you're always going to wonder, am I, am I practicing it well enough? Because you're always going to bump into someone who's practicing it better than you. Husbands, usually it'll be your wife. And so you're always going to be wondering whether you measure up. All religions, Christianity included, all religions can give instruction, but hope does not come from instruction. Paul says hope comes from grace through Christ Jesus. Only Jesus Christ can give hope. 
And, and that's because Jesus is God's only offer for gracious redemption for people who are still sinners. We read it this morning. We even repeated it. Jesus pardons sinners. Jesus extends saving grace to bad people, not good people. In due time, Christ died for whom? The ungodly. The ungodly. This is not complicated. It only requires humility to receive it and thoughtfulness to appreciate it. Those verses that, that Kent read from Romans, they're, they're such wonderful, wonderful verses. In Romans 5, I hadn't planned on reading this. Look at Romans 5. When you jump down to about verse 6. Here's how I think we're, we're, we're drawn by this text in a way that doesn't just tell us a truth. The text is worded in such a way that is designed to draw us into thinking about it. You know these words. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. And then this little interjection that to me doesn't seem to fit. It always always comes like an, an interruption in the text. Talking about Christ and... Christ dying for the ungodly. And then he says that halfway through verse 7, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ Christ died for us. And I I always wonder, what's that little thing for? He's showing how Christ died for the ungodly. While we're sinners, Christ died for us. What a wonderful thing that is. And then this little blurb in there, well, maybe for a good person someone would die. Why does he do that? See, in a little while, we're going we're gonna to come to the Lord's table. And, and we're going to contemplate the grace that we receive through Jesus as he dies for us. Only I've, I've never, I never saw Jesus die on the cross. I mean, we stick him up at the front of churches. We sing about it. We have communion. But I wasn't there. And so, so Paul tries to help us out. And, and in the middle of this theological explanation, he says, now just, just imagine if you, if you were sitting in church and the only reason you were here, um, you, you, had, you had some kind of a, a dreaded disease. You needed, you needed a, a liver transplant or a heart transplant or whatever. And it was an emergency and they couldn't find anyone to do it. And you had a really close friend. And blood types matched and everything else. Just pretend. But someone here that you knew, okay? So it's like, like, it's like, it's like Kent and it's me. Just pretend. And I'm, I'm really, really sick and I'm dying. And, 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 and he comes and he says, um, you, use my heart. And somehow, I know this wouldn't happen, okay, in in a hospital or anything like that, but just pretend. Somehow in the process, so so he he literally loses his life. They take his heart, and it's in me, and I'm still going. So I keep coming, and I keep preaching, and I'm going to look down there, and he's not sitting there. And I know, I know for the rest of my life that the only reason I'm alive is because he's dead and Paul knows that we don't think of it that literally about Jesus dying for us he knows how easily this becomes just a it's like a religious concept you're you're sitting here today alive and you're all of you you're here because someone someone died for you 
And that's the only reason you're here. And so what, that, what it would do to me, just thinking of the illustration with, say, Kent and I, I what it would do to me is it would, I would say, you know, I, I just can't, I can't waste this life. You know what I'm saying? I can't waste this life. It's like doubly precious. There's been a lot invested here. And I can kick myself for the number of times I come to the table and I think about Jesus dying for me. And I think it's what Paul means when he says, you've, you're here, maybe you're 18, maybe you're 14, maybe you're 50, maybe you're 90. But as long as you can understand the truth, you're old enough to get it, that there's, you've been bought with a price. Your life isn't yours. There is so much invested in you. Someone died. So you've got a chance. And the thrust of the whole thing, of course, is Paul says maybe for a good person someone would do that. But the really amazing thing is, and this is the grace, hope coming from grace. Jesus did that for me when I was his enemy. It would be a wonderful thing for a close friend, a husband for a wife, a parent for a child. Someone lays down a life for someone. It's, it's a moving thing. But this goes way beyond that, Paul says, because you couldn't earn or accomplish this in any way. You're his enemy. You're godless. You're a sinner. And then he died for you. If I get what I deserve, hope dies. This is the connection with hope, okay? If I get what I deserve, hope dies. If I get what Jesus won on his cross, if he really died for the ungodly, if grace is really free, if it's really amazing, then Paul is right when he says, Jesus gives us, here's the phrase, good hope through grace. That's why the symbol of justice is a balance and things are weighed. And that's why the symbol of grace is a cross. It's the greatest symbol of hope for sinful people. Paul says there's this grace, Romans 5, 2, in which we stand. I take that to mean that I, I live in God's grace every day. It's the grace that enables me to keep going or to switch the telescope around and look through the other end. The moment anything takes the place of grace in my experience with God, my performance, my intellect, my morality, as important of all, as all those things might be, when they take the place of grace in my experience with God, I guess I don't stand. That would mean I fall. I can't stand anywhere else. Now, grace should do a lot of things in my life. Paul says it should make me thankful. It's in our, tests, our text in, in Thessalonians. It should make me holy. It's grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness, the Bible says. I would never want to do anything to make light of the precious blood of my Redeemer. Grace should make me forgiving toward others. How dare I? How dare I? Make other people qualify for my acceptance when Paul says every day I exist I stand before God only by grace how dare I that's why I, I, I said it before this is why we celebrate communion and we celebrate it together because if I just had communion by myself in my home I, I could certainly there appreciate forgiveness Jesus forgave me, and I could all by myself, maybe a little prayer, read a little Bible, take the cup, take the bread, thank you, Lord. Now, except for people who absolutely can't get out, shut-ins or people in hospital, we don't celebrate communion that way because Paul says not to. Come together, he says. Why? Why can't you sit in your house and I sit in my house and we'll just all ponder God's grace and how wonderful it is to be forgiven? Why together? Because 
All the people that irritate you in this church are here. And all the people you bug without even knowing it are here. Really. Really. And we're, we're to stand with all those people that rub us the wrong way, who have wronged us. Some have genuinely wronged us. Paul says, I want you celebrating grace with your enemies. <laughs> because maybe then you'll get what forgiveness is and you'll extend it the same way you've received it. This isn't just about feeling forgiven. And my, isn't it wonderful? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. That's true, but that's not all that it's about. Love one another as I have loved you. How is that again? Oh, yeah, you died for the ungodly. You extend mercy to people who don't qualify. You loved us when we were enemies. That's the word. That's the word. So, so grace should do all of those things. Surely that's true. But as much as grace does any of those things, grace makes me hopeful. Hopeful because not only did I not bring anything to the table to originate my salvation, no good deeds, no merit, I don't sustain my good, my standing with the Lord through grace by my good deeds or my self-worth. Today, just as much as when I was saved 46 years ago, it's still all by grace. I don't need the grace less now than I needed it to come to Jesus. I need the grace just as much. Paul says we stand in it. It's, it's where we live. Heaven is certain because of God's grace. Eternal life is certain because of God's grace. My good deeds would be a terrible foundation for my eternal life. A terrible one. My hope isn't built there. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, you might have more money than I do. It's possible that you're a better husband than I am. You're here and you might be an atheist and you may be a better parent than I am. You may be more successful in every way. You may be healthier than I am. You may live longer than I do. On the whole, you might be a more jovial, hopeful, optimistic person than I am. It's entirely possible. But you need to know that you are also eternally without hope. The Bible says so. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul writes to the church. What a good text as we gather around the Lord's table. He writes to the church, to the redeemed, and he says, Remember, Ephesians 2, 12, that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. So Paul writes to believers, he writes to the redeemed, he writes to the church. And it's not just that we're told that we were without hope. That's not all there is in the text. The point is we're told now that we have hope in Christ, we're told that we're all to remember that we were once without hope in Christ. I think that's fascinating doesn't just say, Don, you were once without hope, but now you have hope. That's in the text for sure, but there's more there. What he's saying is, Don, now that you have hope, don't for 30 seconds a day, don't forget that you were once without hope. Never forget that you were once without hope. Always remember that you were once without hope. It's simply too easy to lose sight of it. And we're to remember it because we're to force ourselves 
as we remember it. We're to force ourselves to look at these two contrasting conditions, hopeless and hopeful, and that we've all been freely given hope, and that we've been given hope by grace. We didn't earn it. We didn't qualify for it. We didn't get hope because we're good people. We don't have hope because we don't swear or we don't, or we don't steal or, or we don't take the Lord's name in vain. We have hope because we've understood Jesus Christ saved us while we were enemies. Hope comes from grace. It comes from, first of all, experiencing grace. And it comes, second of all, from remembering grace. This is what we do. I think it was so important to Jesus that he said, I want you to do this until I come back. Never forget about grace. You'll need it in your relationship with Christians constantly. Because until you get to heaven, until you get to heaven, people are going to wrong you but no more often, probably, than you've wronged them without even knowing it. And so everybody's going to need, everybody's going to need grace. But even more than that, you're going to need it because without this, you're going to lose hope. You're going to lose hope. You're going to wonder, you know, religion does one of two things. Either you practice it really, really, really well, and then you look down your nose at people that don't do as good a job. If you practice religion well, it makes you proud. Which is a sin, <laughs> which takes away your hope. If you practice your religion poorly, you're going to feel condemned and like you don't qualify, which will take away your hope. My point is religion can't give you hope. Not any religion. Jesus gives you hope. It's the gift of His grace. Everyone who gets it, say amen.